Job, as a literary and biblical figure, gives us a lot to think about. He goes from riches to rags to riches again. He loses his family, but begins another. He's at the center of a contest between God and a devilish character. He relies on his friends, but those same friends accuse him of doing evil works. What can Latter-day Saints think about when considering Job the book, Job the figure, and the implications of both man and scripture? We'll discuss that and much more in today's episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm a public communication specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Christian Heal is a research fellow at the Institute, and each week we discuss the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today we are once again joined by Derek Baker, one of our research assistants. Derek is an ancient Near Eastern studies major focusing in Greek from St. George, Utah. After Derek graduates, he plans to become a high school history teacher. Welcome back, Derek. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Now, Christian, the Come Follow Me block is chopped up a little bit, but we are going to be looking at the book of Job in its entirety. What's going on in the book of Job? So the Jewish study Bible states boldly that Job is the most difficult book of the Bible to interpret. The difficulties seem to me to be threefold. First is the difficulty in explaining the elaborate arguments of the several speakers, including, and perhaps especially, the Lord in chapters 38 through 41. Secondly, there is the difficulty of understanding the highly poetic language, which includes a disproportionate number of what are known as hapax legomena, which is Greek for things said only once. This means that translations can vary considerably, and that we may never fully understand this book at the lexical level. One of the best responses to the many linguistic and poetic conundrums posed by the Book of Job is Edward Greenstein's recent Job, A New Translation from Yale University Press, which we'll refer to in this episode alongside other translations. And finally, there is the problem of the book's structure, which has led scholars to conjecture layers of compositional history and proposed various ingenious solutions to resolve some of the book's literary difficulties. So, the Book of Job offers a series of poetic speeches on suffering, framed by a prose prologue and epilogue, which seem to cohere with each other, this prologue and epilogue, but have an ironic relationship with the body of the book. The prose framework presents a heavenly council in whose hands lay the happiness or suffering of humanity. Job is presented by God as an exemplary man, but the heavenly prosecutor, Hasatan, makes the argument that his righteousness is simply a function of his blessedness. A test ensues in which Job is deprived of his possessions, his children, and his health to see if he will still remain faithful. Job proves worthy of the challenge, and in the prose epilogue, all that he lost is restored to him, though his livestock are doubled. The main body of the book is a poetic symposium on suffering organized in three acts. The scene is set in the prose prologue, where Job is joined in his distraught state by three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who come to console and comfort him in his suffering. The best that can be said of these three friends is that they have the grace and good sense to sit with Job in silence for seven days and just be with their friend in his suffering. Job breaks this silence with a long soliloquy lamenting his birth in chapter 3, and this kicks off not so much a dialogue but an exchange of speeches, which is why scholars refer to these sections as something of a symposium. In the speeches, the friends argue for the piety taught throughout the Old Testament. If you are righteous, you prosper. If you are wicked, you suffer. Job counters that by complaining that God is bringing about his suffering without reason. This is unjustifiable suffering. In his experience and his argument, the wicked also prosper and the righteous suffer. The divine economy seems to be breaking down at the edges. Job protests his innocence to the end, and it is eventually confirmed by God. There are two cycles of each friend speaking and Job responding. 
but in the third cycle the pattern breaks down and there appears to be some anomalous additions. Then a new character, Elihu, appears to offer a strident monologue that extends from chapters 32 through 37. It's at this point, after this monologue, that the Lord interjects, responding to Job in two speeches. So Job is given a few verses to respond to the Lord, and then we enter the prose epilogue in which the Lord chase, chastises Job's friends for not speaking the truth about God, as Job had done, and then Job petitions the Lord on their behalf. This is certainly a difficult book, and one that has a curious relationship with the rest of the Bible, but its power and importance as scripture has never been questioned, and Job is quoted in the Old and New Testament as well as Restoration Scripture. As Walter Brueggemann observes, the book of Job lives rhetorically and theologically at the edge of the Old Testament. Rhetorically, the book takes up older genres and patterns of speech and fashions them into the most artistic and urbane statement of faith in the Old Testament. Theologically, the book takes up old covenantal and sapiential presuppositions, challenges basic premises of Israel's faith, and refuses any easy resolution of the most difficult theological questions that appear on the horizon of Israel's faith. In other words, this is a book to think with, and we will certainly be rewarded and challenged as we each respond personally to the Lord's question, have you considered my servant Job? That was beautiful, Christian. Thank you. One of the first things that I noticed in rereading Job for today was the presence of Satan, or in the original language, Hasatan. Derek, what have you learned about the Satan figure who appears in the prologue to the book of Job? So the Satan figure in Job is quite different from the way Latter-day Saints think about Satan, the way Christians have thought about Satan for thousands of years. He seems to reflect more ancient Israelite traditions in which God had a sort of divine council, and that council kind of appears in this book as the heavenly beings or the sons of God, and they're gathered together at the book of Job. And included in those beings is this figure called Satan. And God asks Satan um, what he's been doing. And Satan says, I've been going around the earth, walking up and down it. And God kind of responds to this and says, have you considered my servant Job? Seemingly out of nowhere. And this passage makes a little bit more sense if we put it in the context of what ancient Israelites thought about a figure called the Satan. And it seems that what they thought was that there was this divine being called the Satan in the divine counsel of God. And the role of this divine being was prosecutor or accuser, or in some cases, attacker. So in the divine court, Satan would accuse people of sin on behalf of God. He was a servant of God who fulfilled certain of God's functions, as did all of the other kind of divine beings. That has obviously changed since then. Our thoughts and thinking about Satan is very different now. But in this book of Job, it does appear that Satan is serving God. Satan does not do anything to Job without God's permission. God explicitly gives him permission to damage his livestock, his family members, and eventually Job himself. I think this is really kind of a fascinating and important distinction to make, that our picture of the adversary is really developed in what is known as Second Temple Judaism, and is inherited then into this New Testament world. And when we read the New Testament, Satan is the figure that we know. He is the adversary. He is actively fighting against the forces of good, and is much more of a, of a sort of Milton-like figure. But as when I think of this Satan as a, as a prosecutor, as an accuser, it reminds me of Doctrine and Covenants 45, 3 to 5, where we kind of see the other side, perhaps, of this heavenly court, and that is the side of the advocate. In these verses, Jesus says, listen to him who is your advocate with the Father, who would perhaps been accused, and then our advocate steps in who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy Son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thyself might be glorified. Therefore, Father, spare these my brethren that believe in my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. 
And so these verses seem to present an atonement theology in legal terms, with Satan as a prosecutor, absent at the moment, but Jesus as our advocate and father, and our father as the judge. Unlike Job, we're not perfect. We have sinned, and we're subject to being accused of having sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. But we have this advocate with the Father, which I find to be a very comforting doctrine in the face of what we know as this kind of accusations that we're not worthy to return back to our Heavenly Father, most substantially from ourselves, I think. I find this really helpful, but it also brings to mind questions about the role of Satan in God's plan of salvation for us. Now, we aren't ancient Israelites, and we aren't beholden to their conceptions of Satan, but I do think that it would be worth some time to pause and think, how does Satan fit into the larger role of the plan of salvation? So this is an important question, and my mind immediately goes to Father Lehi's adage that there has to be an opposition in all things. In our own theological worldview and the sort of divine economy within which we enact our lives and live out our religion, we are confronted with this world of opposites, this world of being called and enticed by God on the one hand and called and enticed by the devil on the other. And so what this adversarial figure does, this Satan figure does in our own spiritual worldview is mean that we constantly have agency presented to us. We're constantly be presented with two often opposing ideas. Now, we have situations in which we're choosing between good, better, best. We know that. The role of this adversary, which we're taught in the scriptures is to disrupt God's plan, is actually serves to fulfill God's plan to guarantee the agency of humanity. I also think about what James Talmadge says in the Articles of Faith, which is that Satan could be redeemed if he would choose to do so. But because of his nature and the choices that he has made, he will not turn. He will not use his agency to accept an advocate with the Father. He will not accept the atonement. Now, thinking about other advocates, Job, unfortunately, does not have an advocate, as you mentioned, Christian, and knowing is defending his innocence. In the body of the book, there's these series of speeches in which Job protests his integrity and interrogates God. In other words, saying, I haven't done anything wrong. Why are you doing this to me? And his friends try and get him to own up to his mistakes so as to preserve their particular worldview that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. These speeches are filled with poignant and moments that can fill us with wonder and awe, but also maybe cause us to scratch our heads a little bit. What are some of the highlights in your mind, Derek? In Job 5.17, Eliphaz is talking to Job and he says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Here, Eliphaz incorrectly assumes that Job's suffering is a kind of correction or chastening. Though the suffering does come from God through Satan, Job hasn't done anything wrong. He still has not even cursed God, though to do so after losing literally everything for no reason seems understandable. In Job 6.21, this is the NRSV version. Job says, you see my calamity and are afraid in response to the accusations of his friends. And this to me, I, this is the most significant phrase from the entire book of Job in my mind. Job seems to say that his friends are frightened by what has happened to him. Oftentimes our instinct is to explain away suffering as somehow redemptive or good. After all, a core tenet of Christianity is that Christ's suffering was redemptive and necessary. Job might say, though, that this instinct to ascribe meaning to suffering is mostly a manifestation of our fear, namely our fear that something horrible might happen to us seemingly for no reason. So in this one phrase, at least the way I read it, it seems that Job is suggesting that his friends are defending God so fiercely and accusing Job of having sinned himself so often because they are afraid of what it means if Job is suffering without having deserved it. They're afraid of what it means about how the universe works and their place in it. And that's significant to me. Yeah, it reminds me of what the historian Kate Bowler has written about in her book, Blessed, who Blair Hodges interviewed several years ago on the Max Waltz 2 podcast, but also what she wrote in a book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, about how our search for certainty often gets in the way of experiencing God's grace. And I think we also have to acknowledge that. 
seemingly arbitrary suffering is terrifying. And that's certainly something that I feel uh, frequently as I look around in my own community and, and see children who have died and, and the suffering that their parents have experienced as a result of that, cancer diagnoses and other illnesses, husbands who pass away leaving their wives with children. This is the kind of terrifying reality of the, of the world. And I find myself kind of clinging to a worldview where if I do as I'm told and live in Provo, <laughs> maybe only good things will happen to me. If I just sort of do the things which all of Job's sort of so-called comforters are telling us that I should do, then I'm going to be okay, that I won't be kind of struck down. And it, because that is the, for me, the kind of awful news of life is that these terrible, terrifying things happen. And I think if it's just yourself, of course, you kind of worry about these things. But as soon as you start to sort of look around at your family and think of your parents and your siblings, think of your children, this suddenly, this terror is sort of multiplied. And we spend our lives with our kind of in that state of fight or flight, trying to avoid at all costs the kind of awful things that can happen. Or, or it can feel like that. I think that you've really struck on something there, Terry, that this is a, a moment in these few lines of this book that kind of captures our whole psychosis as believers in a world filled with suffering. And Job's interactions with his three friends throughout the entirety of the poetic section of this book pretty much consist of his friends refusing to confront suffering that isn't warranted, suffering that wasn't deserved. In Job 8.4, Bildad implies that Job's children are killed because they had sinned, as if, first of all, that would make it better. The text says no such thing. He is just kind of reaching for straws in the face of an existential crisis. So all of these explanations that Job's friends are giving him are short-sighted, they're misguided, and they're motivated by their own fear. Yeah, pro tip for those out there, when something bad happens, try not to blame the person that it is happening to for everything bad that is happening. It poignantly brings to mind John chapter 9, where Jesus says that a man was born blind not because of his sin or the sin of his parents, but more or less because it just happens, that it's for the glory of God to be made manifest. It's troubling, it is soul-searching to think, why do bad things happen? much less why do bad things happen to good people. But I think it's one of those things that we have to rest our faith on. Our faith isn't that everything is going to go swimmingly. It's a trust that everything is going to work out in the way that it's supposed to. That God is mindful of us and can see the end from the beginning and can create situations that will lead to the best eternal outcomes, even if they're not the best temporal or best immediate outcomes. I think there's also a connection to Matthew 5.45. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, For God maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And even though for modern readers, rain sounds kind of like a gloomy thing, I think for ancient readers, that would also have been kind of an equivalent to sunshine, where it's a good thing. You need rain to have food. And so I think the, the notion that God blesses kind of indiscriminately in this way, as Jesus is saying, I think that can also bear on how we think of cursings and where suffering comes from is sometimes people receive blessings regardless of their sinfulness or lack of sinfulness and people receive cursings the same way regardless of sinfulness. I'm struck in a, a sort of a different way by a particular sort of poetic parody that happens in Job chapter 7 and this is a reminder to me that when we read the book of Job at least the majority of the book of Job we're dealing with one of the great poets of the ancient world and possibly of the world, a master of language, a master of feeling, a Homer-like, a Shakespeare-like sort of talent who is wrestling through these voices with one of the greatest problems confronting all of humanity. But he's still this sort of clever poet. And in Job seven seventeen through 21, the poet is sort of riffing off of Psalms 8, 5 through 6. This is a passage that we, we know well. What is man that you are mindful of him, mortal man that you have taken note of him, that you have made him little less than the angels and adorned him with glory and majesty? 
you have made him master of your handiwork, laying the world at his feet. So here the psalmist is wondering at God's graciousness to humanity, that, that God is mindful of them, that God is watching over them and granting them blessings and taking care of them and uh, treating them a little less than the angels and giving them mastery over his handiwork and control over all the elements of the earth. But the author of the book of Job plays with this mindful of, of God and turns it on its head uh, with the idea that God certainly sees and engages with humanity, but has this sort of darker tone and almost a comedic sentiment about it. The verses read, and I'm reading from the Jewish Publication Society translation, What is man that you make much of him, that you fix your attention upon him? You inspect him every morning, examine him every minute. Will you not look away from me for a while? Let me be till I swallow my spittle. If I have sinned, what have I done to you, watcher of men? Why make, you, make of me your target and a burden to myself? Why do you not pardon my transgression and forgive my iniquity? For soon I shall lie down in the dust. When you seek me, I shall be gone. This whole sentiment has now been turned on its head. Job is now looking for God to, don't, could you forget me for a minute? I don't want any more of your care, if this is what it looks like. I don't want any more of your sort of divine watchfulness, if this is what it looks like. Here I am, suffering. And the despair is sort of palpable in this moment, but also the sort of humor. You kind of feel this sense of, you know, kind of enough already. I'm actually reminded of, of something my brother-in-law, who's in the Marines, talks about, which is that once you've been through boot camp, it becomes funny with other people who've been through boot camp, but you can never play off as a joke with those who haven't been. And I think in some ways it's the same thing as those who have been to the missionary training center that, or served a mission in general, that today's tragedies are tomorrow's comedies, but they're only comedies with people who understand the pain that you've gone through as well. Yeah, definitely. This is a humor born of suffering and suffering in a theological worldview in which all the blessings and all the suffering, all human experience is in fact provided by God. And this is part of what is sort of happening in these verses. And what I think, I mean, as I've thought about Job in preparation for this podcast, becomes one of the most central themes of this poem, and that in this suffering, there is a transformation that's happening. And it's perhaps not the transformation that we think is happening. It's not necessarily transformation to a sort of a state of humility. It's not a transformation into a greater sense of submissiveness, but oddly a transformation into a state in which Job in his suffering is willing finally to talk back to God, which creates a kind of an interesting situation. And it reminds me of this opening of the famous song, If I Were a Rich Man, in Fiddler on the Roof, where Tevye addresses God and says, Dear God, you made many, many poor people. I realize, of course, that it's no shame to be poor, but it's no great honor either. So what would have been so terrible if I had a small fortune? This, it's the same worldview in play. God is responsible for all of the kind of bounties of the earth, and gives and takes and and uh, as he pleases. And here is Tevye saying, well, you know, you could have given if you wanted to. Things didn't have to be this way. And this is a humor and a relationship born of suffering. And I think this special relationship, actually, that the Jews have with God, I would have to sort of argue, is a relationship born of millennia of sort of suffering in their faithfulness that qualifies them to be able to sort of talk back and to have this kind of different kind of relationship with God. Well, now that Job has spoken back to God, he's found his courage or his faith, or maybe a mix of both, God ultimately responds to him. What happens in these last few chapters as God responds to his son? So when God finally interjects in this series of speeches and brings this kind of divine voice and divine power into this experience, into these chapters, into this poem, 
he does so in a way which is somehow disconnected from the matter at hand. Instead of explaining undeserved suffering in the world, God instead returns to the beginning, to creation and his role as creator. Instead of answering Job's interrogations, he asks Job questions in turn. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Have you ever commanded the day to break, assigned dawn to its place, so that it seizes the corners of the earth and shakes the wicked out of it? These questions seem to extend from the mightiest acts of creation to prosaic elements of the order of the earth. Did you give the horse its strength? Finally, God asks the question outright, would you impugn my justice? And then God continues to describe his incomparable works, which include, interestingly, the taming of the mighty behemoth and the untamable Leviathan. So we have this speech in which God is doing some work that's entirely unaccounted for, unexpected. This isn't a defense of his divine economy but a reminder of creation, taking us back to those moments of creation. Job's response to this is generally understood to be penitence. In this display of God's or this kind of reminding of God's power and presence in the earth, Job responds, and this is how it's done in several different translations. For example, the English Standard Bible says, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's, this is Job 42.6. Robert Alter's recent translation, therefore I do recant and I repent in dust and ashes. A slightly more expansive version, the Message Bible, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'll never do that again, I promise. I'll never live on crusts of hearsay and crumbs of rumor. The New Jerusalem Bible, I retract all I've said and in dust and ashes I repent. So the response of, that Job gives, as these translators understand it, is one of regret and one of penitence. I am sorry, I retract, I withdraw all of my complaints, all of my criticism, and I repent. Interestingly, in Edward Greenstein's new translation of Job, which reflects decades of work on this beautiful and and, uh, difficult poem, he gives us a different reading of this verse of of Job 42.6. He translates this as, that's why I'm fed up. I take pity on dust and ashes. The Lord's answer to Job is on the face of it unsatisfactory. In Greenstein's reading, Job seems to be saying, I know that you have this awesome power, and in fact you have the power to stop senseless suffering, and that's why I'm fed up. That's why I take pity on humanity, because this senseless suffering persists. Okay, so looking at Greenstein's reading, maybe it's right, but where does that leave us. That doesn't seem ultimately like a hopeful message or something that we can gain greater faith from adhering to. It's right. I I find Greenstein's translation compelling, and I think he may well be right. But is the proper response to suffering to simply acknowledge the awesome majesty of God? Or is there something else going on? This is the question I find myself asking. And as I was reading through this, and particularly as the Lord himself takes us back to creation. I found myself thinking about creation through the restoration scripture lens and thinking of Moses chapter 1 verses 4 through 5. Here the Lord says to Moses, And behold, thou art my son. Wherefore look, and I will show thee the workmanship of my hands, but not all, for my works are without end, and also my words, for they never cease. Wherefore no man can behold all my works, except they behold all my glory, and no man can behold all my glory, and afterwards remain in the flesh on the earth. It seems to be an aspect of the work of God and the divine economy, aspects that are not so much too great for humans to bear or understand, but to understand them or see them somehow means that we're no longer suited for this world or this estate. There seems to be a holiness to that knowledge which makes it no longer possible for us to live in the world as agents, perhaps, to live in the world in the same way that we're expected to in this particular state of probation. So, in other words, maybe the 
book of Job is teaching us that the answer to senseless suffering is not to try and discern some unrecognized cause or to justify God or even protest one's innocence, but rather to submit to the ineffable divine instruction of heavenly parents who are trying to make us like them. So I don't like this idea. And it reminds me of another passage that I don't really like from the epistles of the Hebrews. Not like, I mean, I, I love it as scripture, but I don't like what it might mean for my life. But this seems to be relevant, and it kind of relates to something that Derek had to say. This is from the chapter 12 of the epistles of the Hebrews. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as his sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye are without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. I don't think what God is advocating here is some inherent value to sort of pain and suffering. Could it be that there is something about unwarranted suffering that makes us sons and daughters of God and partakers of the divine nature? Could it be that there is some holiness to the knowledge that is acquired only through this means? It certainly seems that this kind of suffering comes with the kind of divine instruction that cannot be taught by words, develops a relationship with God that can't otherwise be formed. And in the face of that kind of instruction and that kind of suffering, I myself can only really stand in awe and silence. I think that's a great place for us to end today. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast? And follow us on social media at, at BYU Maxwell on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and sign up for our newsletter at mi.byu slash edu. Thank you and have a great week.